This is a very, very exciting moment right here. This is like, um, you know, when you're a kid and they have like whatever the holiday cal calendars and you pop open the, the, um, the little doors and pull out the nasty, <laughs> the nasty candy. Here we go. Ready? I'm a few days late to this too. So we're going to move on from Caspian. And on to, oh, wow. Look at that. Luca in Sierra National Forest, California. That looks like a big, fatty, yellow lab. Having a nice one in the National Forest, so. Anyways, we've moved on to April. Alrighty, welcome to Cine 399 Integrity Farms. We have Tegrity. Um, happy to have you here. We're in week three, day one. So I'm probably a little uh, backlit here, so a little silhouetted, but you know, not the worst thing. You don't have to look at this mug in fully three point lit fashion. Um, but anyways, we're out here on the tractor. This is tractor lecture day two, where we're going to talk about Mark's class in poverty in South Park. Believe me, I bet you are so excited. <laughs> um, we're going to watch a couple episodes in this class, and you're going to want to follow around, uh, along with the slides um, for this. So we're going to watch uh, Last of the Mexicans and 1%. Um, so I hope you enjoy those episodes. We're going to watch those in class. And yeah, we're gonna rock this. Um, hope everybody can show up on Mondays for our happy hour at five o'clock. It was, it was lit last week, so to speak. So hope y'all can come through and just, you know, vibe out, chill out, maybe share some music, what, whatever, just chill. Uh, talk to human beings. It's crazy just to think about that. Um, anyways, all right, so we're gonna talk about Matt Marx, Karl Marx, old boy, crusty old German dude, just to, you know, the note is, uh, you know, he did like to drink and he did like opiates, so I don't know, maybe that makes him a little cooler. But um, let's just talk about a couple things, kind of get the ball rolling here uh, specifically. A um, little bit about critical theory. Don't jump out of your seats, right? But what is theory? What is actual theory? For me, the way I think about theory, it's a way about it's a way that you connect the dots. La la la. How you connect various dots, things that happened in the world, and to say something about those things that happened in the world. That's really the basics of, of theory is you're really just ob observing or testing what happens and you're connecting dots and you're saying something about them. Now, the problem with so much critical theory is that it's bound up in academia and it's written by people with degrees who like to write it so only other people with degrees can read it and it fucking doesn't make any goddamn sense. You try to read a lot of academic stuff, it's like billions of words and you need to know what 10 of those words say. Just say it in 10 words. That's kind of like what I like to do uh, in this class. Um, so that's kind of what theory is, right? So what critical theory is, right, is basically you're looking at cultural artifacts. In this case, in this class, South Park. Or it could be, you know, things that South Park parodies or, or uses in its text, right? And what you're trying to do with these, you know, these texts, right, that you're, that you're, you're looking at is basically to look at the underlying ideology. What is being expressed? What is the value system and whose interest does it reflect uh, in that content, right? Um, and you want to think about like these, this word that uh, a lot of people, I don't like to use it because it sounds too crazy, dialectical materialism. Wow, right? The basic way that I look at this and talk about this is that, you know, and this will get into like Marx, is that, you know, um, you know, the physical informs the mental, meaning those basically controlling material forces, things like owning companies and owning property and basically you know controlling physical commodities and property and intellectual properties even too um, allow you to basically construct the views of the world not only about those things but 
in, in general. And that's very, very important. And within this, you know, you have, um, you know, contradictions. And this is a big part of Marx that we'll kind of, kind of, kind of get into. And that these contradictions, right, the contradictions between, you know, the proletariat, the working class, and the bourgeoisie, the, you know, the, the, or the capitalist, etc. you know, those are contradictions. And those would cause social change, that there was too much contradiction, you know, wealth, poverty, you know, all that stuff that, that, that caused social change, okay? A couple other things just of critical theory is to think of, and I've brought up this word dialogic um, and synthesis. Um, you'll write a paper in this class which is synthesis, um, a synthesis paper. And the idea with synthesis is that, you know, um, you know, that, uh, you know, ideas are met with their opposites and it creates an end point. Okay, and an end point is an end way of, of thinking. Dialogic, in terms of dialogic theory, you have, um, there's no end point. So there's a constant conversation between ideas and ideologies and, and theories and views and texts and, and this constant conversation where, you know, the, the synthesis is not an end point, it's an ongoing synthesis. That's what dialogic means when we talk about critical theory. Um, when we talk about text as encoded productions, this gets a little bit back to intertextuality and authorship. And the sense here is that a text is, a text like South Park or anything we consume is encoded with a set of ideas, usually that reflect the author, the interest of the author. That's, you know, broadly speaking. So what we're trying to do when we, when we read into and deconstruct the text is looking at the you know, whose interest does that text serve, you know, and what is it saying? And then other things we look at when we're thinking of critical theory is discourse. And discourse is everything from, like, language, uh, images, all forms of communication, specifically that come from authority figures, um, politicians, celebrities as authorities, etc., etc., that shape our vision and our ideas about truth. Okay, and that's really important. That's what discourse is. It's all these bits and pieces of information, of, of things we see, of things that we hear, of things that we read that, that give us ideas about what truth is given a particular matter. So what's going on with the virus and everything, like our, this is, this is manu the truth about it is actually manufactured regardless of what the actual, uh, the actual truth is. So. Um, and lastly, one bit about critical theory is like we need to differentiate between art and entertainment, right? Um, South Park is a little bit of both because art is always a reflection of society. It's always somewhat political. There's always an element there and political meaning not, you know, Democrat, Republican, whatever, whatever, meaning that there's a contestation of over ideas, over the dominant discourse or, or you know, um, the dominant ideas of society, there's a challenge to it, um, or not, you know, um, and I think that's really important. The art should have some sort of comment within it. Entertainment doesn't have to have that, and Self Park has both of those things. It's entertaining, but it's also art. So these are just some bits of critical theory that we should know. Okay, Karl Marx, Karl Marx, fun stuff. This stuff, I, again, I just want us to know these theoretical ideas, and then we'll get us through some of the episodes. And just, you know, again, thinking of classic philosophy, um, you know, and some of the concepts here, right, that are not only expressed in South Park, but maybe ways that we can think about South Park differently when we think about actual critical theory. All right, so Marx, you know, hey, if I put Das Capital in front of you, you probably, you know, crap in your pants trying to read through that shit. It's really hard to read. Or anybody even talking about it, it's like incredibly painful. Um, so uh, basically Marx, the way that, you know, this is like a historical reading of society where he looked that basically all evolution, social evolution, all history was based on struggles, particularly between various classes you know, peasants in the ruling monarchy, you know, or w whatever you want to think about it. Um, in our instance, the working class, working middle class, whatever you want to think about it in the capitalist, the 1%, right? Um, and that, that this, like, history is about struggle. And this is really important, specifically class 
struggle, conflict between classes. Um, and this is you know, a way you can look at many things like wars or many historical events. And this is how he did it. And he asked himself something really important, right? Because he was, he was in, um, he's German, he was in Great Britain during a lot of the Industrial Revolution, uh, drinking himself to death. And, you know, he asked really two questions in his large theoretical work, you know, or, you know, uh, or one, one main question, I guess. How does capitalism, this, the mode of production, the system of organizi- organizing our society, so- society, how does it reproduce itself? How does it continue to live and thrive? And there's two answers to that. Consumerism is the main, the first answer, right? We all, we all buy stuff. How do we buy stuff? By selling our time as laborers to someone who then creates what's called surplus value off of us and that's the second part of it surplus value is this right i work for someone else let's say the university of oregon they pay me a wage right money made after that wage is paid after expenses are paid right like expensive administrative costs building costs etc etc Right? When I teach a class, the money they make off of your tuition dollars after all expenses are paid, labor, etc., etc., is what's called surplus value. It's called profit. And these are the two things that basically allow capitalism to continue to perpetuate and live on. The fact that we bought things and we buy things, and in order to buy things, we must work. And then when we work, for the most part, and most ways unless we are a capitalist even if we own a small business like we're still we're still part of that part of that system uh, and 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 the order you know the thing is, is we work to buy and therefore through our work right basically time unpaid is is kind of how you could you could think about uh, think about it or labor that's like you're paid for the labor but you're not you're not paid the full amount of the value of the product right is where surplus, service, uh, surplus value is created. And this is sort of where like the real evil part of capitalism is, exists, is not compensating workers fully for the labor. That is, you're profiting off of their, their labor um, and paying them a, a smaller wage here, okay? So he saw these, these contradictions in his grand theory was, you know, there was a, there was a, 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 a huge contradiction between capital that was, you know, you know making, basically make, making, making money, making profit, and labor, which is uh, selling your, all we have when we come into the world is time. That's all we have right, is selling our time, our, our, our freedom, so that someone can make money off of it. Awesome. That's, that's, that's great. And then he saw uh, another contradiction in, in classes, the proletariat, which was the working class, and the uh, bourgeoisie, which was, you know, the, the capitalist class, so to speak. He had um, Part of his grand, uh, his other grand ideas was this notion of the um, the economic base, and his view was like, whoever controlled the economic base controlled the superstructure. So, owning the means of production, the factories, the raw materials, the distribution networks, the retail chains, however you want to think about it, right? That's the economic base. All the things you needed to make. St- products and services that are bought and sold in the marketplace and if you control those right you also control the superstructure which is the ideas the ideas of dominant society so those who control the means of production those the capitalists essentially control the ideas of society what society viewed as normal what society viewed as right um, etc. And that's really important. This is called economic determinism. So those who control, you know, and own um, the economic base, that determines whose ideas are reflected in the superstructure. And the superstructure is made up of everything. That, not everything, but it's made up of things like school, religion, uh, 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 media, you know, stuff like, stuff like that, you know, things that inform ideas, um, and those ideas that are often represented in those things, right, are what are good for capitalism, right, um, 
you know, which he, which is called the mode of production is capitalism. You know, so these are some of his freaking terms, you know, to kind of break them down and maybe, maybe simplify them. Maybe you're more confused. Maybe you're like, next, <laughs> get me out of here. Okay. Um, and the, the important thing to note is he thought that once basically, once basically, um, you know, co- controlling the, you know, means of production changed, the superstructure would change, meaning that like the ideal ideology or ruling ideas would change with whoever controlled, you know, uh, uh, society through like owning the economic base, the means of production, who owned, who owned the companies, you know, who owned the, the factories, etc., etc. Whoever does that, would control the ideas. So his concept of synthesis was like we'd get to communism. Like that was like his end point. Um, you know, like communism was, you know, where we get. And then the ruling ideas would reflect that of the people because we all had the same thing. You know, we all know like maybe that wasn't the best idea and his his theory maybe wasn't the greatest. But I mean, when you talk about labor exploitation, you talk about surp- surplus value and some of those things, and like the economic base, economic determinism, like you kind of see that shit. Like, so he was one of the first to really kind of like put that down on paper and kind of like really think think that through. Not all of his shit was right. Not all of it was solid. Um, in the chapter we read, I mean, he gets you know critiqued for not really thinking about race relations um, in terms of his of his grand theory. He only saw it as class relations uh, specifically. Um, but that's Marxism. That's real dirty, raw. Uh, Marxism. So let's just like chill out, have some integrity, you know, whatever. Um, Max, relax, Anglo Sax, and just take a break. I know I just overloaded you. And then we'll talk about cultural hegemony. <laughs>